and end up dead because his clients have declared that they want them dead and that they think that they are terrible. They're entitled to their opinion, but they're not entitled to shoot animals. So we're just I don't think any That's a group the plaintiffs in this case. For the defendants. All right. I understood from Mr. Bobber that we were here on a motion for continuance. Looking at the file, is the pleading I should be reviewing the plaintiff's first amendment request for order compelling compelling the defendants to appear for their deposition for the first amendment plaintiff's motion for continuance? Any hearing? No, Your Honor. That is a motion that is set for here on December 5th. Okay. There's a hearing set on December 6th to set a trial date. The motion for continuance is to remove the hearing set for November 20th on the application of the defendants for temporary judgment. Okay. I do have a notebook. I guess this was something you put together, Mr. Stratton. Is that right? If you mean the motions, that is correct, Your Honor. Well, I have a notebook with a bunch of pleadings. Somebody... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Say again. Sorry. I have a notebook with a whole bunch of pleadings. I assume oh. is that was put together yeah. by your office. As a courtesy to the court, because the court might want to look at the underlying pleadings, we gave you a, a, a binder okay. that contains the two motions, or the motion really two, two motions, and then the live pleadings of the parties. Hold on, hold on. We're having some audio issues. Uh, Ms. I want you to say something to see if it's just Mr. Stratton, because I'm getting a lot of feedback from Mr. and uploaded it to Box this morning, along with the 14 exhibits that were mostly just emails between the parties. Okay, your, your audio is fine. Mr. Schmidt, I need you to say something else, and let me see if your audio is going to be okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, that seems to be working. It was like a bunch of, uh, I saw Ms. Spicer is my court reporter. I'm going to change her name. I can do that. Um, okay, so then we can um, go on, and I'll let you know if we have a problem with this. Yes, Your Honor. You know, as I pointed out, the pleadings the court may wish to look at are in the binder. Yes, the, the actual motions are those at the beginning of the binder, the motion to continue the November 20th hearing. Um, we've filed eight exhibits from P1 to P8. And with the court's permission, uh, I'd like to go through those, put them on the screen, and they come up with discussion at the court mm -hmm. with that. That's fine. <clears throat> okay. Before we even, if my allergy is getting away, Your Honor, I apologize for the cough. Give me, uh, let me give you a little background to help understand what the case is about. There's no trial currently set in the case. The motion to set a trial is set, set for December 6th. The, the case involves a dispute between two adjoining landowners in an in unincorporated portion of southwest Travis County. There you have been neighbors for 12 years. Their tracks have joined each other. The defendants purchased the three acre tract on which they currently live from the parents of the plaintiffs in 2011. So they've been uh, neighbors for 12 years. The dispute is over so the validity of the validity of and the extent and enforceability of a 22 year old perpetual and exclusive easement that gives the plaintiffs a directly access across a quarter of that three acre lot. There are other complaints between the parties regarding trespass and things like that, but the principal dispute is whether or not the easement can be enforced and the extent of the easement. And that is the subject of the application for temporary injunction and the motions that we'll discuss for summary judgments. Since February 24th of this year, the plaintiffs have been attempting to obtain the depositions of the defendants. There have been multiple resettings, multiple notices, multiple agreements. The defendants have never appeared. We're not asking court to decide the merits of any of those arguments between defense counsel and myself. It's just the background that leads us into where we find ourselves. We reset the depositions in June for August. The response from the defense was the filing of a motion to quash. We reset the depositions again. A second motion to quash was filed and a motion that is an application for a temporary injunction was filed on June, July 11th. The application for temporary injunction requests permission to install gates across both ends of the easement. I believe Ms. Ruffner's response in the case is they're proposing a single temporary gate, but the application proposes two locked gates across both ends of the easement. <clears throat> because we had advised the defense in February that we would not agree to any substantive hearings until we had depositions, and because we hadn't had any depositions, we filed a motion to quash, <clears throat> a motion to set aside a motion to quash, and a motion to compel deposition to defendants and to continue the application 
a temporary injunction hearing until we had their depositions. The hearing was set for August 15th, but it was reset because principally of a conflict between the judge assigned to hear the case and Ms. Ruffner and Ms. Jackson. There were no other judges available or enough time available to have it heard on the docket for August 15th. So we attempted to reset it and we'll give credit more and try to get it reset for us on August 31st. But a problem arose when that we tried to do that. We had reset, and I noticed the depositions of Mr. and Mrs. James for August 28th. That meant that those notice depositions conflicted with the proposed setting. <clears throat> the result was that that had to be resolved. And if I may share the screen, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Of course, should be able to see a document on the screen. No, not yet. It's not showing up yet. Yeah, let's see what it does. You hit share screen first. We did. And let's try it again. There you go. No, it's okay, back. didn't take first time. I might need to make it a little bigger, please. All right. Is that was it catch up to us? Is yeah. that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to the last page. This is where the discussion regarding a resolution began. Ms. Ruffner proposed that we reset the depositions later into September with the agreement, since we would not budge on having a hearing that would argue that we have the right to have their depositions before there's a hearing on the temporary injunction. Yeah. She agrees to that. I would not use the setting resetting a deposition by agreement as a basis for any claim or waiver your objection. Your speech. If that will show up and enlarge itself. We pointed out to Ms. Ruffner that if we agreed to do that, our motion would remain a live motion. And we were open to an agreement that would preserve their right to have their motion to compel depositions and to continue the application for temporary injunction, if that could be resolved and preserve that. The result was a Rule 11 agreement. And we'll see if that expands so the court can see it. Yes, sir. Thank you. So we may state clearly, if we have an agreement, the passing of the deposition by mutual agreement does not constitute and will not be argued to constitute a waiver of our objection to a hearing on the application of temporary injunction prior to their depositions, meaning no hearing on application of temporary injunction until the depositions. And I say I have no objection to that agreement. The response from Ms. Ruffner is simple. That works for me. So uh, as of August 14th, we have a Rule 11 agreement. It has never been rescinded. So where we are is that we have an agreement that we have the right to have a hearing to compel the depositions and to continue any hearing on the temporary injunction. That comes first. If it's granted, there is no hearing on the temporary injunction until we take the depositions. If there is, if it's denied, then of course the temp application for the temporary injunction could go forward. But here's where we find ourselves. We've gone through a pattern on settings in this case of the defense requesting that we reserve dates for hearings. And then the hearings never occur and no notice is ever sent. On September 21st, 23rd, we were asked, we were told that the defense was going to abandon the temporary application for a temporary injunction. They were going to set a motion for summary judgment on October 26th. And we were told, don't schedule any Washington, D.C. hearings. I should explain, I'm, I represent a national organization and run a congressional legislative program. But okay, the I'm defense. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you unshare your screen so I can see you all in a bigger screen? Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And with your permission, I'll come back and put another document when I'm ready. But whenever I'll... you're ready, you don't need my permission. You can just pull it okay. up. So we set aside the dates requested by the defense, October 26th, I think 25th and 26th. No motion for summary judgment was ever filed. No notice of any hearing was ever given. So we waited almost a month to accommodate the defense, but no notice, no hearing. There, after that, and during the period time, there were multiple discussions on trying to get a setting on the two motions, our motion to compel and continue their motion for an application for a temporary injunction. There was a discussion on August, I'm sorry, October 11th, that November 20th might be an available date. 
Based on discussions with Warren, we thought it was available, but it came down to agreement of the parties. I sent an email to Ms. Ruffner going, okay, this date's available. We'll hold it for you. Let us know if you want you to accept that date. We never heard a word from the defense. No email, no telephone call, nothing was sent. It was consistent with what we've seen before. They rushed to set things aside, but never any agreement on the dates. That week came and went. The next week came and went. Still nothing. Then suddenly on October 23rd, we got an email. 12 days later after, would you let us know? Suddenly, 12 days later, we get reserve November 20th. We're going to file notices. We're back to hearing the application on temporary action. The email, and let me uh, go back to my screen for a second here. The uh, notices never came. We waited the entire week. No notice of any second. Seeing that it was consistent with a prior pattern, we gave up waiting on the defense. So on Friday the 27th, after waiting about 16 days to agreement on the setting, we filed a motion to have our motion to compel and to continue set for December 5th. We obtained the setting. We filed the motion. We obtained the setting. We gave notice the same day. And that notice was given in accordance with the rules of school procedure and local rule 2.4. We also that day obtained a setting on our motions to set a trial, sent a notice for that. Both notices were sent to the defense on the 27th Friday. And if I may, I know you I'm asking, but it's a habit of always asking the court before I do something. All right. All right. This is the notice of hearing for in order to compel the depositions and to continue any hearing on the temporary injunction. The same day, as we pointed out, we gave notice of the hearing on motion said wrong. But because we're trying to get this case resolved, we sent another email that day. We pointed out that since we had not heard from the defense, we went ahead and set these two motions to lock in two hearing dates so that we could have our motion heard. And if our motion is not granted, they have the defense's application for a temporary injunction heard. And we made it real clear in the bold that if there's a conflict in the dates, if we need to reset, we would work with the defense to reset so we could hear both motions. That's, that's the Rule 11 agreement. It's been that way since August 11th. We had no response from the defense. On Monday, now I will point out that October 27th was 16 days, over two weeks after August 11th, when we said, talk to us about a hearing. And there was no response. On Monday the 30th, we filed a motion for summary judgment. That motion of summary judgment is on exactly the issues that are the subject of the application for a temporary injunction. Again, the issue is whether or not the defense the defendant, Mr. Mr. Jones, had the right to put gates on each end of that 22-year-old easement. Our position is that easement is a rare, exclusive easement. It cannot be modified. Their position, obviously, is different. The, uh, if the, temp the motion for summary judgment is granted, Your Honor, the key issue in the case is moot because that summary judgment will result in there being no right of the defendants to seek any modification of the easement. So it, it, it moots the TI completely. The, um, the result of filing the application for or the motion for summary judgment was silence. Again, no response from the defense. We sent a notice. Or actually, we sent the notice on the first. So, but we filed the motion. There's no response. So we had no response to the Friday filing of the motion to compel and continue. No notice, or no response to the notice to set the hearing on a trial date. No notice, or no response to the motion for summary judgment. On October 23rd, we received an email that I'll permit the court to characterize the tone of it. I won't. On the 31st, the defense says, I have to point out that a motion for continuance is ineffective if it's set for hearing after the setting for which it continues to seek. First, notice that there's anything else may be set. Our response was that we've not received any notice of the hearing on any matter. Because we had not. Four and a half hours later, this appears. I think to be polite, the title of the motion is disingenuous. It says amended notice. There has never been any notice of any hearing on November 20th. If we have not sent the email saying there is no notice, no setting, 
this would have never appeared. So the, where we are at the moment and what we're asking for in relief from the court is that the setting on the 20th violates the rule 11 agreement that we displayed to the court. It also violates sorry, local rule 2.4. It makes clear if you're going to set a hearing, you have to send notice the same day and any delay permits the the argument we're having today on continuance. So what we're asking court to do is whether the court removes it based upon the existence of abiding rule of agreement that our motions to compel and continue get heard first, or the court decides that we were never given proper notice until after our settings occurred under local rule 2.4 to remove the November 20th. We've waited and waited, tried to resolve this, and there's been no effort by the defense to agree to any of it. The simple place we have, and I'm not responding to any of the personal comments in the response filed by Ms. Ruffner. It's not, none of them are allowed through this hearing. Either. If the court wants me to address any of them, I will. I will. I'm not inclined to do so. This is a, the hearing was set in violation of a Rule 11 agreement. No notice was given to the plaintiffs of their attempt to set the hearing on the 20th. They were given every opportunity to set it. They never gave us notice of their intent, or they never, never gave us notice of any setting until five days, depending on how you count, four or five days after we set the agreed motion under the Rule 11 to compel their depositions and to continue any hearing on the temporary injunction until those depositions were given. And we pointed out when we did that, that we're doing this so we can get both motions set. Because obviously the hearing on the 6th for setting a uh, jury date or a non-jury date, doesn't matter, Permits us to slide in their application for different injunction if we want to do so. I think Warren will let us do that. So, without regard to all the other peripheral matters brought up in the response, it's simple. Based on the rule of limit agreement, violation 2.4, which of the court prefers, we ask for the hearing on the 20th, and then we'll be permitted to go forward. And I'll take this down so that the court has control of the screen. Ms. Ruffin. Thank you. I'm going to try to be pretty brief. Um, it's called, it was called an amended notice because our original notice of hearing had a date of August 15th, because that was the first date on which we were supposed to have the temporary injunction heard. And what date, and that's was, why that, what, what date was that notice of hearing set? The, the very first one? Sure, that had the August 15th date. Um, we sent that notice of hearing. Hang on one second. I can tell you. Um, My it looks like records tell me that it was August 3rd. Okay, August 3rd was a notice of hearing for August 15th. Yes. All right. And so this is the same motion. It was called an amended notice of hearing because it's a different date. Well, right. And um, so then you have to get to, if you admit, it's a different date. So we have to get to, Mr. Stratton is showing me why he thinks that there wasn't an agreement as to that date. So show me where there was an agreement after August 3rd when you sent a notice. And you sure. didn't go for it on, on the 15th is when... You weren't heard. You're supposed to be reset. Sure. I will show you, um, if you give me just one second to pull it up, and I can tell you which one it is in the Dropbox. Um, well, I prefer that you pull it up. I can I can pull up the Dropbox yes. myself, but I think it's better that we all look at the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, this is D8, and I will share my screen now. This is an email from Mr. Stratton. Um, and it says, he offered November 20th, 21st, and 22nd are open, and until I hear from you, are reserved for this case. Okay, and that so was, that was on, 10, on October the 11th. Yes. Okay. And um, Mr. Stratton suggested that I didn't respond. Something he may have forgotten was that after this email, there was a little bit of back and forth. As we mentioned in our response, this was now the fifth effort we had made at making a setting. There was the first setting, which he mentioned. He didn't mention the one where he called the day before the setting and said he needed to reset. He then um, offered dates, but pulled them back. Offered dates, but it was a typographical error. Let's, and then let's, 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 let's address, please tell me there's a rule 11 agreement that says there will be no TI until their deposition. Yes. 
That's not what that says. What the Rule 11 says is, if you reset your deposition, I'm not going to say it washes out any objection you might have. What we had had on the 15th and the order that things were going to happen was temporary injunction hearing August 15th, depositions a couple weeks later. Then we had to reset. Uh, Mr. Stoughton suggested the 31st, and I noted, that's one of the dates that you have scheduled for a deposition. And he goes, I tell you what, I'll move the depositions. We can have the hearing, but I still want to be able to object to this hearing on the basis that I haven't had my depositions yet, which was an objection he was going to pose on August 15th. And I said, fine. There is a process for registering an objection if you think that you haven't gotten necessary discovery, and that's to file a verified um, motion for continuance that says, I've been trying to get this discovery, and I can't respond to this adequately until I get this discovery for this reasons. So my only point was, I wasn't going to say, well, you reset them, so you waived that objection. That was all I was agreeing to. My agreement was never, we'll have depositions in the temporary injunction hearing. And most temporary injunction hearings, frankly, are held before most of the discovery anyway. The reason that this became necessary is that now that the main complaint that they had in their pleadings of a water storage um, container has been completely washed out because it was moved a year and a half ago, all they're left with is, we think that we don't like your dogs. And so his clients came up to the property line and were harassing the dogs and wrestling the bushes and then videotaping it. And so we thought that that was ridiculous. And given Mr. Stratton's prior recommendation that he thought that what should happen is a record should be made, the county should remove my client's pets and kill them. And so we said, we're going to need a gate. Right? So that's why we were moving on the temporary injunction to get a gate in. We think that we're complete within our rights. We frankly could have picked a weekend where his clients were out of town and just put it up, but we're trying to do this the right way. So we drafted a temporary injunction basically saying, we need to get a gate up so that the dogs don't wander across an imaginary line that they are not cognitively capable of recognizing and end up dead because his clients have declared that they want them dead and that they think that they are terrible. They're entitled to their opinion, but they're not entitled to shoot animals. So we're Ms. just Doctor, I don't think any of that's relevant to the issue I'm deciding today. And as way that, that that is unnecessary. I'm not hearing the merits of this case, and I don't want to get into that. This is about a continuance. And I gotcha. So the order had been on the 15th, TI Wait. hearing, then depositions. And so then we were moving the TI hearing. Okay, so okay, hold on. Okay. I guess I'll look back at what the, the the, it's a rule, what's the date the Rule 11 agreement was filed in the court's file? And I'll just pull it up. Either of you, please. The Rule 11, the actual agreement, Your Honor, was filed. The 13th of what month, Mr. Strang? November. Since Thank they're you. Uh, Okay. Speech over uh, priorities. We thought later. We so, finally, that's uh, all. You answered my question. I'm going to let Ms. Ruffner continue. Go ahead. As this went on, as I noted in my response, Mr. Stratton had blocked off more than 40% of the time between April 1st and October 1st for vacation, including an entire month from I the beginning of... Ms. Ruffner, this is about this setting. I don't, I don't want to hear that. And I see, That's I mean, fine. I looked at this file before I got here. I saw all sorts of motions to quash that you were, I mean, several. So I, I get it. Y'all haven't been able to schedule this, but... These were dates that he offered, and he said that he was going to keep them open until he heard from us. When he heard from us about those dates, we said, please review the 20th. Please reserve the 20th. For me to be confident that I could do that, the 20th is a, is a Thanksgiving week Monday. My kids don't have school. We were planning to travel. I had to move my travel, ensure that I had arrangements for my kids, and make sure that my clients were also available before I could commit to the 20th. And I frankly don't think that a week to do that is an unreasonable amount of time to ensure that um, I, I could make that happen. Those were the, he offered me the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Thanksgiving week and said that he would reserve them until he heard from us. When he heard from us, we picked one of those dates. And what day did you, what day did you send your notice of setting? We sent our notice a little bit later, and I'd like to explain why. Just tell what me the date. Set... What, what's the date you sent the notice of setting for this? Sure. Night? The notice was uh, sent, I believe, on, gosh, I'm so sorry. 
because I'm looking between 10 and 11, I'm looking at all the notices of set hearing. You ought to not to interrupt this reference, but just to help the court see the notice was sent on October 30, 31st at 4.22 in the afternoon. Okay, so October 31st. Um. So, Ms. Ruffner, let me ask you that, this. So the notice was, you all have it first. So you think that you should, people, when you exchange dates, you keep it open for 20 days? He said, until I hear from you. That's 20 days. We emailed him to reserve that date on October 23rd, which was a week later. So we didn't wait 20 days to say, please have it on the, we're going to, we're going to move you forward on the 20th. Me, you just showed me originally an email from October the 11th. So yes. you're talking about those dates. And then you tell me there's not a notice of setting until the 31st. That's correct. We notified him by email that we intended to have the hearings on the 20th. At that point, we contacted the court and we, he had said, said him broadly. And so I said, let's have a, the TI in the morning of the 20th and the summary judgment on the afternoon. And so we requested those from the court a couple of days later before those settings were accepted. It is, it's our practice to not send the notice until the settings are accepted. Well, hold on. The court said, all, hold on. First of all, you go online, you get settings accepted, you do it then. It doesn't take a couple of days. In this case, they weren't automatically accepted because the court called us and said, we don't allow an attorney to set uh, two things at the one thing in the morning and one thing in the yeah, afternoon. Make any, that doesn't make any sense for judicial economy, frankly. I agree, but Mr. Stratton had told me before that if we were going to do them on the same day, he thought that we needed three hours for the TI and two hours for the summary judgment. So I was attempting to accommodate Mr. Stratton's request. I became aware that that is not permitted. I needed to get clearance from my clients to drop the summary judgment. And that is the order in which those things occurred. We requested the settings. They weren't accepted by the court. The court later called us. I had to get client permission before I could advise the court about which one we were going to keep or drop and only then were they going to accept the one we were going to keep and then we were going to send the notice so it we hadn't yet secured it on the court's docket until probably i think a couple of days before we sent the notice but we had advised mr stratton that that was the date that we were going to ask the court to set the temporary injunction for so we weren't asking him to sit on his heels we just had some other things that were happening in the meantime before we were able to secure the hearing with the with the court administrator. And I had to get permission from my client to drop the summary judgment. So I wouldn't have expected him to keep it open 20 days. I didn't think a week, given that he was asking to have a setting in the week of the Thanksgiving week was unreasonable. I sent him an email and I didn't hear from him until four days later. Your Honor, I, I know, I think probably my response, if you read it, I know that you don't like this kind of a hearing. No, I, I frankly think you're likely to grant his continuance. I just didn't, given that this is the fifth time we've tried to work with Mr. Stratton and his incredibly unaccommodating schedule to get this set, and we've been trying to do this for several months, we probably were never going to get a setting without coming before a judge. Your Honor, if I may interrupt for a moment, I asked the email that October 27th put it out. We reserved two dates. Hearings of two motions. Our motion to challenge is new, and we've got six that's available. If the summary judgment is granted on the fifth, fourth, we just said all this is moot. If our um, motion to con compel continues granted on the fifth, the application is moot. If those are denied, then we've got a reserve setting on the sixth. There's no issue here. I'm not going to go into the other comments, but let me make one other point. The rule of evidence, I think, is binding. <clears throat> if you look at what the defense attempted to sit on the judge, I think it's Ms. Rucker's keyboard. Somebody can just wrap it up. I'm not typing. Well, oh, you're not typing. Okay, I'm hearing something. Can you mute yourself? Because now that, okay. No. Now we're not having to go ahead, Mr. Stratton. Yeah. Yeah. Go the ahead. Short, the short point is the rule 11 says there are going to be two hearings. One, our motion to compel and continue, and then there can be an application if our motion is denied. What Ms. Rucker, on behalf of the defense, has admitted. Is that they didn't, they waited 20 days to give any notice, and they only set one of those two hearings. The key was if you're going to get an application heard, ours has to be heard first. So it didn't matter which way you want to look at this, breach of rule 11, <clears throat> the lack of notice, it all comes down to the same thing. The hearing on the 20th is a violation of all the agreements. We've got a hearing, the motion compelled on the 6th. If the defense wants to set their application behind it, we reserve that date on the 6th. Let's just do it. 
But in terms of going forward on the 20th, with respect to the court, we request that the resolution be enforced. Whether you enforce it based on rule 11 or you enforce it based on the rule 2, we ask that the setting be stricken. I've offered him time at the beginning of the 20th for his motion to be heard. He told me no. So I, I'm trying to accommodate him. I, I just don't think he wants to move forward. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Time before the hearing, so he has to get ready for a TI before he can have a hearing on his motion to compel the depositions. And I can look at the file and see that that's been ongoing for months. I'm trying to get depositions. And so the motion to continue the, the November 20th setting is granted. If you all want to set on the 20th, you want to do, seems to me, and I'm looking at the rule 11 agreement and I disagree with, uh, I agree with Mr. Tratton's interpretation of what that, that was. So we'll try, wanna... and, we'll try and work it out. You know, I sent you a proposed order. If that's not a couple, we'll draft a different one for you. Have you sent it to Ms. Ruffner? No. Yes, we uh, filed it with the uh, motion. Of the first file is the case. <laughs> Ms. Ruffner has not indicated she's got a problem with it. But if she does, we'll make a modification to it to Ms. accommodate. Ms. Ruffner, have you seen this order? No, I haven't. I don't know what he's referring to, but I'm happy to look at whatever he sends later today. Respectfully, Your Honor, we had to reset. I, I just want to be clear about I, I have there's a non-zero chance this case is going to come in front of you. The reason for the motions to quash was that he refused to let me present my clients at my own office. So I, I don't know that the file gives an accurate representation uh, of well, exactly Ms. how Ruffner, to I don't I don't know that when I practice law and I notice a deposition, I could notice it at my office. I don't know that you're in that there's any rule that allows that says you have to present your clients at your office. Look, let's just let's get some settings that work. But I, it does seem to me looking at the file and the motion I looked at before, as well as the, the rule 11 agreement that the um, you need to have a hearing on the compel before you have the T.I. And, I'd be happy to do that on the 20th if Mr. Stratton would like to go ahead and get that teed up so we can figure out what comes next. Your Honor, I will send you a send an order to Ms. Ruffner. Uh, to make certain it's acceptable. If it is, I'll forward to the court. Mr. Before, Mr. Stratton, are you available on the 20th on your motion to compel the depositions? No, Your Honor, we're not. It would take up most of the morning anyway. Excuse me? It would take a good part of the day. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be enough time to have the other motion heard. That's the reason we said it. Oh, the motion to compel depositions, that can't possibly take more than 30 minutes. No, it might, but the, the answer to the court's question is no, we're not. That's the reason we said it for the 5th, and we reserved the hearing on the 6th so that we could hear the application on that day. If Ms. Ruffner wants to do that. That's what this has really been about. He didn't keep the date open like he promised. Well, we have a we have, as I understand it, there are hearings on the fifth on his motion to compel and on the sixth for your TI if he's not successful on his motion to compel. Yes or no? Is that what I understand correctly? Well, we have on the sixth, we set a motion for uh, get a, a jury setting, but Warren will let us swap out for the application. And my email to her the 27th, I said, that's the reason we reserved it so we can get these set. Okay, hold on. I'm going to make a docket note. You have a hearing on the 6th to get a trial setting, and we're going to set here your motion to compel depositions at the same time. Well, the, 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 the compel depositions on the 7th or the 5th already. On the 6th, we can have the application for temporary injunction. Okay. Days. That's the reason we said it, because we have full, enough time for both motions. The 5th, we're going to hear the motion to compel. Yes, ma'am. And to get a trial setting. We can have we can do it on Sunday. I don't think Ms. Ruffner will object it. It'll take five I don't minutes. know why we have honestly I don't know why we need a hearing on it. I've given him several options. He can just set it. I don't know why we're having a motion. I think the court can look at the uh, back and forth in this case and understand why we can't agree. But that will give us certainty we can have it. I can get more in the Yes, you have settings on the fifth and the sixth. We're gonna pass the hit setting on the twentieth. I see that you have there's it looks like it's on the fourth, fifth, and sixth they're setting. The fourth is a motion for summary judgment. The fifth is a motion to compel and continue, and we can move the uh, hearing on the trial that we cannot agree by then to the fifth, and that reserves the sixth, but I've already got reserved with Warren. We can put the application for temporary injunction there. It's a, it's a three-hour hearing. The only thing, I, 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 I've issued my ruling on this motion for continuance. Yeah, thank you. All right, Ms. Ruffner, uh, Ms. Stratton, just email her a copy of the order that you previously provided. And I'm going to get something signed today. Ms. Ruffner, if you have an issue with it, it's a, I can read it to you. But it's I can put it on the record. We don't even need an order. I'll put it on the record that I'll pass the hearing. If that's the court's order, I will pass the hearing. And we don't let, have to. Let me, let me read this to you. The plaintiff's motion to remove an improperly set hearing came on before the court on the 6th day of November. Plaintiffs appear by and through counsel John Robert Stratton. Stratton Law Firm defendants. The Joneses appear by and through counsel. Based on the motion, the pleadings and the argument. Uh, 
of counsel for the parties. It is the opinion of the court motion should be granted. It is ordered that the hearing sit on defendant's application for TI set for November 20th is ordered to be removed. Do you have an issue with any of that, Ms. Ruffin? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Maybe excuse your honor.